Hey kids, Charlie Abuso here. All right, the last slideshow crashed. I'm making these slideshows at home. Uh, it's a snowy day. It's uh, President's Day actually. Um, and the internet crashed. I think, I don't know, something with the snow. And when the internet crashed, the recording stopped and it stopped a little bit after this. So I'm gonna go back to 78 and start over. I was about 41 minutes in. I thought I had about five minutes to go. So this last Zoom is gonna be really short. We gotta go from 78 only to number 85 and we'll be done with this whole section. So here we go. Sorry about that. Can't help it and I can't fix it. Are there exceptions to this trend? The, the trend, the group trend or the period trend for net and clear charge? Think hard, here we go. No, when you're going across any period, the table is set up by order of increasing atomic number, which means increasing number of protons. So every box you go across, you're adding one proton, add another proton, add another proton. There's no exceptions to that. And when you go down the groups, at the top of the table, you add eight protons at a time. And then in the middle and the bottom of the table, you add 18 at a time. No, they jump, 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 up, up, up. There's no exceptions. This trend is perfect. Now, what about this? What if we wanted to actually predict the actual sizes for cations and anions? And I know teenagers hate to do any kind of predicting. They, they're nervous to commit. You're going to have to commit. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. There's no right and there's no wrong. So if we look first at lithium, lithium is in metal, got an electron configuration of 2-1, and on table S, the radius is 32 picometers. Now when it becomes an ion, it loses one electron, becomes a positive one ion, and its electron configuration is just two. It used to be 2-1, the one electron disappeared, the whole orbital disappeared. So what is the approximate size for the radius of a lithium cation? Well, if it's 32 for the atom, and this has a whole orbital less, it's got to be less than that, but probably not going to be half, but it could be, has to be less. What did I pick? I don't know. There's no right answer. I picked 24 picometers. That's a good number. You pick 23 or 22, it's okay too. Magnesium. Magnesium has a 282 electron configuration, and on table S, the atomic radius is 140 picometers. Now, when it becomes an ion, it has to lose its whole outer orbital, becomes 2 8, becomes positive 2 ion. So its electron configuration now just 2 8, it's noticeably smaller. So, what would be noticeably smaller? I don't know what the actual answer is. There's a number in a book somewhere. I don't know what it is. Man, approximately 125 picometers. It's a chunk smaller. 120, 114, who knows? Probably not 138, though probably smaller than that. This seems like a reasonable approximation. The scandium. Oh, look, they all jumped up at once. Scandium on the periodic table, 2892, has 159 picometer radius. It becomes a positive three ion, and it ends up as a 288. Goes from four orbitals to three orbitals. Got to be smaller, the ion, right? How much smaller? Nobody knows. No, 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 I don't know. You don't know. Pick a number. What did I pick? 138. Go from 159 to 138. Is it is it really is it really 21 picometers smaller? I don't know. Who cares? Smaller. Now, oxygen and phosphorus, they're red, they're different, they're nonmetals. Nonmetals gain electrons, right? Cations are always smaller than their atoms, but the nonmetals that make anions are a little different. Oxygen, 2-6, happens to have a 64 picometer uh Radius from the table S. I looked it up. When it becomes an ion, though, because it's a nonmetal, it has to gain enough electrons to be isoelectric to mobile gas. Going to gain two electrons, become a negative two ion, O negative two ion. Now, it's got 10 electrons now, but it still only has two orbitals, two orbitals. But the electrons are all negative, and they're going to repel from each other. So this outer orbital is going to stretch a little bit bigger. Anions are a little bit bigger. So it's got to be bigger than 64, but not a lot bigger because it's, it's going to squeeze these electrons in. They're going to repel from each other. I picked 71. Maybe it's 74. Maybe it's 70. I don't know. It's approximate. Phosphorus. Phosphorus element 15, 285, has a, a radius of 109 picometers on table S. I didn't know that. I looked it up. Put my finger in the box. When it becomes an ion, it's got to gain three electrons. 
So it becomes isoelectric to argon, becomes a negative three ion, still has three orbitals. But now this outer orbital, instead of having five, it's got eight, eight electrons going to stretch apart. We're all going to repel because we're all negative, and it's going to be slightly bigger. I said 116 picometers. What do I know? It's a little bit bigger. You can do this. You can make an approximate guesstimate based upon whether it becomes a cation or an anion. Cations are noticeably smaller than their atoms, and anions are slightly larger stretched out than the atoms they form from. Why? I already told you this. Cations lose a whole orbital when they become ions, right? When they, be, they lose the whole orbital, and anions are always slightly bigger. Why? Because by filling up that outer orbital, the negative electrons repel from each other and stretch it out to its maximum size. Now, this is the last part. Linus Pauling, that guy in the funny picture from the last slide, he made electronegativity. Now, electronegativity is both what's called a relative scale and arbitrary scale. Both of these things at the same time. Some scales are relative and some scales are arbitrary. A relative scale compares all the members of the group to one that's the standard, right? one that's a standard and everything is ranked. Everything is smaller than this or everything is bigger than that or everything is greener than this one or everything is bluer than that one. One thing is the standard and ranking. Sometimes teachers in elementary school will say line up in height order. Smallest kid in the front, tallest kid in the back. Now, who's tall, who's short? Well, the smallest kid is the smallest, but really maybe everybody else is taller than the small kid. Maybe the tall kid is normal, everybody's shorter than that. It doesn't matter, but you can pick one person in the group and everybody is ranked compared. Maybe you pick the middle kid, the middle height kid. That kid's normal, and then there's lower, you're smaller than normal or taller than normal. This is stupid. Who cares how tall you are? But in a relative scale, everything is relative to one standard. As it turns out, electronegativity is a relative scale. All atoms are ranked according to fluorine. Fluorine has the highest de determination, the highest tendency to gain electrons in a bond. Every other atom wants electrons in a bond less than fluorine. So electronegativity is basically fluorine's the highest and everybody else is ranked according to fluorine. Now it's also, also separate, it's an arbitrary scale. Arbitrary means the numbers don't mean anything. He picked 4.0 for fluorine. Why didn't he pick 10? 10's a nice number. Why didn't he pick 100? We well, could have picked any number. He could have picked, I don't know, 11. Could have picked any number. Pick a number. He could have gave fluorine a zero and said, we have zero is the highest and the higher numbers. The numbers don't mean anything. It's not like this 4.0 some things. It's not a unit. It's just a number. It's a number used to rank. You're number one, everybody else is less than you. Or you're number 10 and everybody's less than you. Or maybe there's 118 atoms. When he did this, there wasn't 118. There's 118 now. Maybe fluorine could have been one and you could have ranked them all in order. It doesn't matter. It, it's, just, it's just for ranking. And actually, a lot of atoms have the same electronegativity values as others. There's a lot of atoms that have a 3.0 or 2.2 or 2.4. So he picked, I don't know, he was a college teacher. Maybe 4.0 is an A average. That's what he thought was the best. I don't know why he did that. This scale, electronegativity, is relative and arbitrary. It's both at the same time. And this is a really cool thing. This is sometimes a region's question. Electronegativity is a relative scale, true or it's an arbitrary scale true, is both, which is really the answer, or is neither. We like to bust your chops on stupid questions, but the truth is it's both relative and arbitrary. And you can make up a lot of scales that are relative or arbitrary, right? Some people think Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time, right? I think he's the worst because he's a cheater, right? But all quarterbacks rank compared to Tom Brady. That would be relative scale. An arbitrary scale is you would say, I don't know, uh, Hank Aaron, is uh, he's ranked 100. He's the best baseball player of all time, and all baseball players are ranked from there. 
And, and what's 100 mean in baseball? It doesn't mean anything. It's just a number. So you can make up scales that are relative or arbitrary, just like Linus Pauli. Now, this is the last slide. Oh, I forgot. Here's another 85. This word is allotrope. Allotrope has got nothing to do with the periodic table. Really? It's a vocabulary word that we stick in here because we don't know where to put it. An allotrope is a chemically pure form of an atom that's bonded in a different way. And therefore, it will have different, sometimes different chemical properties and usually different physical properties. And examples of this could be carbon. Carbon comes in a black powder, right? Carbon comes in pencil. I don't have a pencil. Yeah, I do. Pencil. People call this pencil lead. It's actually graphite, which is carbon bonded in sheets. It's tightly bound this way. And in between the sheets, it's a loose bond. So when you rub the pencil on paper, you shear it off into smearing layers of carbon out. Um, diamonds have very complex three-dimensional bonding that's not in sheets. and makes diamond the hardest structure in the world. And there's also something we had called the Buckminster Fullerene or a buckyball. 60 atoms of carbon bonded in a ball. It looks almost like a volleyball, right? All cool shape. How come? I don't know. Carbon can do a lot of things. All of them are pure carbon, but they can have different properties because of the way they're built. Those are called allotropes of carbon. Oxygen also is an allotrope. The oxygen we breathe through our nose, O2. And then there's something called the ozone layer, which is O3. Two and three are different numbers. They're both pure oxygen, but if you breathe ozone, you don't stay alive. You need oxygen, O2, to stay alive. And if we had no ozone, we breathe fine, but the ozone that blocks the harmful rays come from the sun, if we had no ozone, we'd all get skin cancer and we'd all end up dying, right? So ozone has different properties in oxygen, but both are pure forms of the element. Allotropes, allotropes, there you go. And now, now we're done, all right? So we're gonna do some schoolwork this week. We're gonna learn more about the periodic table. You're gonna write a little bit. This is easy, right? If you're in school, we're gonna be doing a really cool puzzle. And if you're home, if you're home, you're home, right? If you're home, you're home. All right, people are getting vaccinated. I got vaccinated twice already. People are gonna to start to feel safer and safer. I can't wait for all of you to get to back in school safely. And, and we will have a great time when that happens. Please hang in there. Looks like we might have a snow day tomorrow. I don't know, I can't predict the future. I'm not an earth science teacher either, but um, hang in there. It's hard. Even when there's nothing to do, it's hard for me to do this. It's even harder for you to do this. Be kind to yourself. Realize that this is not normal and it's not, it's not easy and you shouldn't necessarily be able to do this easily, right? This is hard day after day after month after month. This has been a hard slog and uh, hang in there. Call me if you need any help and, and try to think of some jokes. If you need help emotionally, I don't know. I'm not a therapist. Call me anyway. We'll have some fun. I'll tell you jokes. I'll try to tell you you're a good person and, and you are. And uh, goodbye. Good luck. I don't know how to turn this off. Here we go. Peace, love, and chemistry. <laughs>